how far can a word go goes as far as we allow it to go or we make it go by itself the word doesn't go anywhere we propel the word with the energy to go by endowing it with meanings often for which it was never meant to be a container in the first place today's session is based upon some questions which had come up in the last sessions one was raised by kiona on mesochism the question there was how far can we take the expanse of the word mesochism and that brought up a more generic question what are the limits of meaning of core words in psychoanalysis how far can a word go and how what has been the history of this core words which constitute the language of psychoanalysis let's go today deeper into it because this is a problem problem is this human beings don't like exactness they don't like to be specific they like to play in the area of the amorphous the mind revolts at the very idea of being specific because to be specific you have to be exact to be exact you have to think hard it is painful and once you be specific you are bound by what you have said and the consequences of what you have said instead we like to be amorphous we like to be general we like to play in the arena of plausible deniability and we don't have to commit to anything and have not to pay the price for anything and that is true for many words also true for a list of words that constitute the language of psychoanalysis today words like love and socialism they mean everything to everybody and nobody really knows what it means same is the fate of many words in psychoanalysis words have been stretched to absurdity words have been stretched to start containing in themselves the opposites of what they used to stand against so mesochism is so stretched that in the extreme it contains even sadism same is the fate of many other words in psychoanalysis problem here also is of language not only the fact that human beings don't like to be exact human beings don't like to coin words where words are necessary to be coined we have a intense procrastination against coining new words and that makes us use the same word for two different things for which there is no need there is no inherent limitation in the number of sounds that we can generate we have more than enough sound generating capacity to create a word for every entity there is no need to use the same word for many entities and that keep issuing clarifications however people love to do that it's almost a favorite pastime of intellectually driven 
and this is true not only in terms of meaning but also in terms of how we pronounce a word our language is very inexact very lawless so words don't have one exact meaning words don't have one exact pronunciation what they call the richness of the queen's tongue i call it the looseness of the language and this looseness of the language is in full play in psychoanalysis so let us look at how far can we allow a word to go in psychoanalysis second what is the history of travel of words in psychoanalysis we will not go today in the philosophical aspect of the language we will not go into what wittgenstein had to say to save our clarity and our wisdom from the bewitchment of the language or to draw limits of thought by drawing the limits of language and where one cannot speak there pass over in silence those elements of wittgenstein's ideas on language which are also important to psychoanalysis we will not deal with them today some other day we will discuss today we will confine ourselves to some key words in psychoanalysis the stretch of their meanings historical evolution of those words and a generic lesson of what lesson we can draw by looking at the history of words in psychoanalysis how far can a word go it will go as far as we allow it to go listed here are some important words in psychoanalysis some of them i will take up for discussion others at some other time let me take up the first word pleasure we started off the discussion by saying human beings are beings of desire our first desire and the core desire is to have pleasure without a moment of pain ceaseless pleasure without a moment of pain this led us to pursuit of pleasure and frustration and anger and pain that arises when our pleasure drive is frustrated and then what happens to that frustration pain and anger if they cannot be fully regulated they can easily produce a symptom either in the mind or in the body or both of them this is how we started off with pleasure as the core desire of a human being pleasure we said is an experience it is a end result of an event we also said pleasure can also be a state so not only a state of feeling but a psychological state also if the feeling goes on for a long time and then we said opposite of pleasure is pain and then we said in masochism pain can also lead to pleasure 
so if pain can lead to pleasure if pain can become pleasurable then what happens to the original meaning of the word pleasure and the original meaning of the word pain the word pleasure here gets stretched to include pain when the pain also is pleasurable and then we said in the unconscious there can be a pleasure of pure pain and there can be a situation where pain is invited because there is a template pain brings pleasure so here pleasure as an opposite of pain to start with pain as a means to attain pleasure and therefore pain as a intermediate state in the pursuit of pleasure second situation pleasure in pure pain itself third situation and then the word pleasure gets confused because if pleasure is pleasure and the pain is also pleasure how do we separate pleasure from pain and obviously we require three different words here a normal pleasure if we say p1 a pleasure that happens after one has gone through pain and one goes through pain in the pursuit of that pleasure with a template that pain brings pleasure if we call them p2 and a pleasure of pure pain if we call it p3 then it becomes slightly clear otherwise it's all confusing because the stretch is so much that it starts including the opposite and there there is confusion we are referring to pleasure of eros or we are referring to the pleasure of thanatos so at least if not anything else we will have to designate that as pleasure of eros pe and the pleasure of thanatos pt take up let us take up one more element let me take up uh, aggression said initially there are two forces the forces of pleasure and the force of aggression so the starting point was the organism has two fundamental drives survival of the self survival of the species survival of the self leads to aggression survival of the species leads to sexuality and libido so these were two disjointed forces almost parallel having nothing to do with each other and then we said in the pursuit of sexuality and libido aggression is involved we see this in sadomasochistic sexual activities we see that in sadomasochistic pleasurable activities non sexual in nature but still Still, libido is a limited nature, and we see aggression actually powering up to intensity the libido, the libidinal activity. So, aggression then becomes no longer a parallel to the libidinal flow, but it becomes a part of the libidinal flow. Actually, becomes a catalyst, an accelerator, intensifier of the libidinal activity. Then we said. sadism itself gives pleasure so pure aggression can lead to pleasure and then we said that aggression in sublimation is actually equivalent of all dynamism so if all dynamism is aggression then aggression is nothing i mean it is little to do with anger is only anger is only one expression of aggression because aggression then becomes synonym to all dynamism in sublimation so we say if somebody is powered up towards his career we say the aggression has been sublimated into his career so if all 
purposeful goal oriented healthy human activities also are sublimations of aggression then aggression becomes equivalent of dynamism and then aggression becomes the opposite of inertia and then a new situation arises a new conceptualization that you have inertia inertia and aggression and out of aggression comes what we say the defending aggression and the libidinal aggression and the sublimated aggression a completely new conceptualization would arise when we put together all the context in which we use the word aggression so we see again here the need for many words instead of creating confusion by using the same word in many contexts let me take another example of uh, split the kleinian example of split let's take one more example of self we started off by using the word self for the conscious part of our being kohut took it up to create a new definition of the self where ego becomes one part of the whole large self and created a structural entity out of the word self you can use the word self also to create a structural entity or to denote a structural entity out of it as a central coordinator of the psyche so for you the self is inborn structurally at the center of the psyche or in some writings around the psyche so the more consensus part is you describing the self at the center and in the circumference of all that we call the mind but there the essential part is the self in the center which coordinates so it becomes a inborn structural entity of coordination of the mind according to a program of life through the activation and deactivation of the archetypes Vinaypot uses the word self in a very different way to denote the true self and the false self. Jung's use of the word self is in a structural inborn sense. Vinaypot's use of the word self is in the sense of a phenomenologically created entity. and cohort's use of the word self is in between it's partly like a phenomenological entity in process but largely a structural entity which is created out of an early life phenomena so partly it is like you a structural entity but not inborn created out of early life phenomena and partly it is in process like vinaypot's use of the word self use the word self in the sense of self and the other and then all these uses of the word self and nobody knows what self means again the same problem of not using different words for different entities and unnecessarily creating confusion let me use the word i forgot uh, i was about to deliberate on split 
Clyde uses the word split to denote early life developmental stage where the good and the bad are completely seen as poles apart. The pleasant and the unpleasant, the safe and the dangerous constitute two ends of a continuum and one is able to think in a primitive way only in terms of the ends of a continuum. It is extreme thinking with which we begin thinking. just as we emerge out of fantasy. And there, how far can we take the word split? Is all extreme thinking a split? Is every duality a split? Even if the duality is not in extreme terms? Is discrimination of two entities itself a split and is the split always bad or can good things come out of the split is split pathological always to be healed or does the split have some pleasant productive aspects to it which would be that the split should at times be created or maintained or managed Again, there is confusion on this stretch of the word split to mean every discrimination between two entities. Even if the discrimination is not extreme and every extreme discrimination being pathological in nature. And the split per se, the early child infantile split also being completely bad. So there is a split about the split. We have not discovered and accepted enough the positive aspects of the split where people who don't have a split are permanently confused because they can't separate the good and the bad. So it's a very necessary part of the development that split should happen and then be bridged again. But split not happening leads to confusion, a pathological confusion. And a split opening and closing too quickly leads to perplexity. The same thing appears now good and now bad. And one is completely perplexed what to do about it. So the split happening and remaining stable is very necessary for a time. And there are good things which also happen in this. And then the resolution of the split rather than a wholesale denigration of the phenomena of split. Point here is how far can we take it? Can we take split to all that is bad? Can we take it to all that is extreme in dualities? Can we take it to all dualities? Can we take it to all sense of discrimination? Can we take it to all separations? How far can we take split? So, so there are other words also which we can go into later where the stretch has been to absurdity, the stretch has been to confusion and we need newer words and clarifications. From the stretch of the words, the travel of the words, let us come to the history of what has happened to words in psychoanalysis. And I have taken a few examples, narcissism, sadism, mesochism, envy. Initially, narcissism started off, or for that matter, Take the case of hysteria that we were talking about. Where how the stretch happens. It starts from convulsions, goes on to include anything that is not explained by a biological cause. So it becomes a category word in terms of stretch. Coming to the history, 
take narcissism freud talked of narcissism as first a pathological state through which we all go through then he talked about i mean the pathological state through which we all go through and emerge out of into health the state of primary narcissism a pre object stage in freud's view of course then freud talked about secondary narcissism and after some years kohut talked about healthy narcissism so freud did refer to a normal narcissism a love for oneself enough to survive do self care and do self love so freud did talk about pathological narcissism what he called secondary narcissism a normal narcissism which we all have and a pathological developmental narcissism out of which we all go through and emerge out of it <clears throat> and kohut then talked about healthy narcissism how narcissism has a healthy version of it and then in indian spirituality we see the use of the super normal parts of narcissism that is where primary narcissism starts getting very near as a state to the state of enlightenment they are not the same they are worlds apart one is the beginning second is the end there should not be any confusion but there is a resemblance of certain aspects of the two states of primary narcissism and the state of spiritual enlightenment so there is an uh, a discussion a presence a working of the phenomena of narcissism in the spiritual process also so we see narcissism that started off as a pathological entity so first it was thought of as a pathological entity then thought of as a normal entity present in everyone first pathological entity present only in patients then normal entity which in lower magnitude is present in everyone then healthy version of it which is present in the talented and a super normal version of it which is present in a few rare individuals who undergo some rare transformational changes and attain to some rare states which we call the states of spiritual progress and enlight or enlightenment so we see how narcissism goes from being called pathological to normal to healthy to super normal and this is the historical path that most concepts in psychoanalysis go through concepts are discovered as in the as being something pathological then people say this is present in everyone in normal quantities then people talk about a healthy version and a sublimated form of what we are talking about and the fact that it has stood the evolutionary test of time and therefore as a sublimated equivalent and then a super normal aspect of that entity and then at the end of it we say the same entity is present in all the four phenomena that is the history of words in psychoanalysis first make an advent as a pathological entity then be discovered as also be present in the normal in lower quantities then there being a healthy sublimated version of it and then be a part of the super normal spiritual mystical and human potential processes also we can trace a similar history of sadism mesochism envy split and so on this is the classical history of words in psychoanalysis so when any new word makes an entry as a pathological entity we should wait patiently to allow it to graduate and allow time to pass so that the word makes the classical historical transition from pathological to normal to healthy to super normal questions on this